Uh, it's a great honor for us to have Brian uh, Chesky here. Uh, Brian's obviously a CEO and co-founder of uh, what I think is uh, actually the most interesting of the up-and-coming unicorns on all kinds of levels. Um, not just the way the world should be, but also uh, various things that I learned from Brian. I learn about design. Uh, I learn about uh, kind of what are the uh, right ways to be an entrepreneur in this set. And so it's a great honor uh, for us to have him here. Thank you for Thank you. coming. Thank you. Uh, let's start with, uh, it may be known, but it's worth starting with the story of Airbnb. Yeah. How did you get the idea? Yeah. <laughs> what were totally. the early days like? Right. Right. Well, uh, thanks, thanks everyone for uh, listening. Um, so, oh, sorry, my thing's coming out. Um, so Airbnb, many people would say that, um, or a number of people said it's the worst idea that ever worked. Or at least I can say a lot of everyone at the time seemed to say it was the worst idea ever, and it worked. So maybe that's the nice connection. It's the worst idea that ever worked. Um, Airbnb, um, I'll just do a really quick kind of background before Airbnb. So I... Um, I'm different than most technology founders and so far that I actually went to art school. So I was an artist by training. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design, and if you guys know about school. And I studied industrial design, and industrial design, I know they teach that here in Stanford. It's kind of like product design, everything from a toothbrush to a spaceship, they used to say, and everything in between, bless you. And, um, and um, I, I, growing up, I, I never really thought about being an entrepreneur. I, I didn't even know that existed. I don't even know if I ever heard the word entrepreneur. That would have been an almost absurd thing to say in upstate New York where I grew up, to use that word. In fact, in hindsight, the only entrepreneur I knew was Bob from Bob's Pizza. And I didn't really want to have a pizza shop, so I don't think it would have occurred to me to start a company. My parents are both social workers. My mom used to have a joke. She said, I chose a job for the love and I made no money, so she should choose a job for the money. And I said, well, I'm going to art school. And she said, oh my God. You chose the only path in life that's going to pay less than a social worker because you're going to be an artist and get paid nothing. And so she said, if you do that, make sure you don't move back home, live in my basement, make sure that you get a job one day, and that if you get that job, that make sure that job has health insurance. And this was like a grand ambition for my parents. So it wasn't about starting any kind of big company or uh, scaling up a company. And so I wasn't going to be able to call my parents, oh my God, what do I do? I have 100 employees, how do I scale? That wasn't going to happen in my family. Um, I ended up going to RISD. And the school had a profound imp impact on me, probably much like here in Stanford, because growing up, you're taught to look straight ahead. Like uh, Growing up, like, you don't get rewarded for being disruptive. You just go to the principal's office. And I was there quite often. And, um, and so I um, got to RISD, and teachers were like, you're a designer. You can redesign everything around you. you can, basically, what they're saying is you can change the world. That's not something that most parents tell their kids. You can change the world. They tell you to behave. And so... Um, I ended up, one other thing happened at RISD, I met my co-founder, uh, one of my co-founders at RISD named Joe Gebbia. And w one day Joe says, Brian, I think one day we're going to start a company together. Well, I'm living in LA, working as an industrial designer, and I remember my life, and you may be confronting these decisions, where everything in front of me in my life would look like everything behind me. And there was the road is like a disappearing road into the horizon. And it kind of terrified me, because it was that job with health insurance. And at RISD, I was told, no, I can do anything. I can change the world, and you're not doing that. And so I had this impulsive moment where I go into work, and my roommate, or my friend Joe at RISD was trying to like convince me to, to leave uh, my company and go to San Francisco, and we were going to start a company. We had no idea what this company was going to be. We just thought, we'll think of the big idea. And so one, <laughs> one day, I go to work, I quit my job, and I'm um, living in a house with a bunch of friends that moved across the country with me, and I say, okay guys, I'm going to leave. And they thought I, was, I had like an early life crisis. They thought like they need to have an intervention. I'm like, no, no, I'm fine. And I took some old mat foam mattress. I rolled it up in the backseat of an old Honda Civic. And with $1,000 at the bank, I drive up to San Francisco. This is October 2007. I get to San Francisco, and Joe tells me the rent is $1,150. I didn't have enough money for rent. That weekend, this international design conference was coming to San Francisco. All th and I, we went to this conference website. And we noticed on the conference website they had like a hotels tab. And we clicked on the hotels tab. And in the hotels tab, there are always hotels. And next to every hotel said sold out, sold out, sold out. And at that point, we just had this idea. We said, well, designers need a place to stay. We literally have no money. In fact, I don't know how I'm going to make rent. So we thought, what if we just turn, created a bed and breakfast for the design conference? Naturally, that's maybe not what most of you think to do, but that's what we thought to do. You know, go to RISD, you're like, I oh, got a creative solution. So we thought, let's create a designer bed and breakfast for the conference. Unfortunately, I didn't have any beds. 
Um, Joe had, he just moved up there. It would be like a floor and breakfast. That's like not the best thing. And so Joe had three air beds. He had gone camping and he had kept some air beds. And we pulled the air beds out of the closet. We inflated the air beds and we called it the air bed and breakfast. And that's where the name comes from, airbedandbreakfast.com. So a lot of people hear the name, they think it's like, a, like a, you know, like air is like the platform and BB is the house. No, no, it's just air beds. That's all this was. <laughs> this was just air beds. And so um, we ended up hosting three people from around the world, a 35-year-old woman from Boston, a 45-year-old father of five from Utah, and a 30-year-old from India. And now I got to tell you, the reason we started doing this is because we thought it was funny, cool, and we make money because we had to make rent. There's something that happens, though. When somebody lives with you, it's kind of like the arc of a friendship gets contracted from a year to a day. In other words, if you were to meet somebody, maybe here at Stanford or in the real world, and you get to know them, how much time does it take to like, invite them over to your house and have dinner with them? It might take like months, even a year. Like, you don't just get to know people. And it, what it did, we realized, is it, con- it, it, it contracted this year-long friendship into a couple days. And so these people came as strangers. They literally left as friends. We ended up keeping in touch with them. In fact, one of the guests ended up inviting me to his wedding, the other guest, this woman, moves to, from Boston to San Francisco, and I think we're realizing there's a bigger idea here. I asked Joe, I said, who's the best engineer you know? Because Joe and I were designers. Joe could do front-end engin- like design, like engineering, but we were both designers and product people. And Joe said, well, my old roommate Nate is. Nate, Joe met on Craigslist. Um, he went to Harvard. He's a computer scientist. And so the three of us got together and we said, we basically had this core idea. We said, what if you could book someone's home the way you could book a hotel anywhere in the world. And that's basically how it started. The one caveat I'll make to the story is after that very first weekend, there wasn't this like flash that, oh my God, this is going to be huge. We actually didn't do anything for four months. In fact, the thing we don't usually talk about is after that, we started exploring creating a roommate matching website Um, because we thought no one would ever do this air bed and breakfast thing, but people need roommates. We thought roommates meets uh, Craigslist meets Facebook, like roommates with profiles. Until one day we typed roommates.com in and realized somebody had built that site. And (laughs) and this was like three weeks or four weeks later. And I said, why the hell did anyone type that site in the first day? Because I just wasted four weeks. (laughs) So we didn't know what to do. We went home for Christmas. And people were like, what are you working on? And I didn't want to tell everyone in my family I was unemployed. So I said, I'm an entrepreneur, of course. Of course, my mom said, you're actually unemployed. I said, no, I'm actually an entrepreneur. And that's also when I learned when you're starting out, the difference between unemployed and being an entrepreneur is in your head. It's usually a mindset. And I was, in my head, an entrepreneur. And they said, well, what are you entrepreneuring? And I'm like, because it wasn't really a common word there. And and I said, well, I got this thing, air bed and breakfast. They're like, air bed and what? And we just started to get used to pitching it. We're like, maybe we should actually do this. And the, we, it was still not obvious. The original idea was air beds for conferences. So we ended up launching at South by Southwest in 2008. And we just, the whole idea was if you're going to a conference, you don't have a lot of money, you could sleep in someone's home on their airbed. And we ended up with a second version of the website we built and we had two customers and I was one of them. So that's kind of how it started. And it was frankly, it wasn't the Facebook story two weeks, it was a longer road. By the way, um, I hadn't known the roommates thing until just now. Yeah, we don't usually talk about that. Yeah, my, first uh, startup myself was called SocialNet, and it was a social platform for a variety of matching services. It included a roommate service. Nice. And that was in 97. We both yes. were kind of circling this. <laughs> exactly. I didn't, I didn't actually realize that. It was, yeah. We had dating, professional networking, activities, and roommates. Yeah. Those are the four things. That's, that's amazing. It's hilarious. I had no yeah, idea. the idea was that like Airpen and Breakfast was not the big idea. And we thought there was a big idea, and we didn't think it was that. We thought it would pay the rent. So we had enough time to think of the big idea. And we thought the big idea was some social networking something. And of course it turned out that the crazy little idea that we thought no one else would do became the big idea. And I think there were a couple lessons there. Number one, all these really good ideas or big ideas often sound like stupid ideas. Somebody once told me in the early days, don't worry about anyone stealing your idea. If it's any good, everyone will dismiss it. And that was exactly the truth. And the second thing was that a lot of these ideas are you solving your own problem and they're not like some life-changing problem. It's in a nuisance. And um, that was clearly uh, the case for us. So what, tell, me, tell us a little bit about the early days. You really had to hustle yeah. to keep it going. Oh, man. So, so we... So we're one of the companies that launched a bunch of times. There, you know, I actually learned something, like because we kept doing launches to get a lot of press. If you launch and no one notices, you can actually just keep launching. And so we just kept launching. Like, we've launched. And like, 
people would keep writing about it as if we launched. We're like, well, just keep launching until we get customers. And we would change things and change the name, and we'd launch again. And so the, the, the first so-called launch was that first weekend, but that was just three people. The second launch was Airbeds and Conference in the United States. And um, we had two customers. I was one of them. And so we thought, decided we'll launch at least one more time. When I, I, I used it in South by Southwest. At the time, there was no payments, and you had to stay in an airbed. And a bunch of people was telling me a bunch of things. They said, why do I have to, like, like I want to go to London, but there's no conference. And we're like, why does this have to be for conferences? At the time, that wasn't even obvious. Like, why would anyone stay in one's, in one's home if there wasn't a conference? It would be too weird. And then we thought, wait, why does it have to be on airbeds? At the time, actually, we had a rule. You had to have an airbed, so you had to inflate an airbed and put it on your mattress. And everyone was like, why am I putting airbeds on my mattress? It's so uncomfortable. And I wake up on one side of the bed, and I woke up, and the like, other, it's like rolled around me, it's hot. And we're like, okay, fine, you don't need to have an air mattress. You may have a real bed. And the, and the, and the final thing was payments. It, you know, I, I don't, we may very well be the first website on the internet where you could actually book in s with somebody else and pay them directly. In other words, there was eBay, and eBay used PayPal, but you didn't feel... Before PayPal, there was checks. There was, yeah, yeah, yeah. checks, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and we had, we, there wasn't a lot of legacy there, you know, because we looked at, there was eBay and Etsy, and they were both before us, and Etsy used PayPal, and both of them you would book, and they would send you on a, pay, a PayPal gateway, and we wanted to feel like booking a hotel. You never leave Airbnb. We would hold Quack to remit the money, and so, um, whereas they were like paying direct, and they would take a cut, and there were two different payments. So we, and that was kind of a crazy idea. It almost scared us. It seemed insane that like you would actually be able to pay somebody else and be able to book something with them, and you would get a reputation system. We decided, Let's just do it. And at the time, we're like, this is a little too crazy. It's a little too scary. I don't know if we're allowed to do this. I'm not sure if it will work. We decided to do it anyway. And, it, you know, it, and so then in the summer of 2008, we ended up basically designing the final version of the product. So we designed this product where you could book someone's home anywhere in the world. We had a rule, three clicks to the book it button, because there were so many clicks and so many uh, different d ways to get a home that it was just too hard. And I remember hearing the story of when Steve Jobs developed the iPod. No matter where he was in his iPod, he wanted to make sure he was always three clicks from a song. And we said, well, you should always be three clicks from a, being able to have a paid booking. And so we created this, basically, a home page with a search bar, listings, the home. And that's exactly the product as you see it today with reviews, payment system, and customer service. And we basically ended up landing on that. But that was the third version of the product. We kept basically redoing the product. At this point, I get in introduced to a whole bunch of investors. Um, you know, probably 15 angel investors. We were raising 100 to 150 thousand dollars at a one and a half million dollar valuation. We were at one million, and eventually someone convinced us we get one and a half million uh, valuation, an extra 50 thousand dollars. So we were trying to sell 10 percent of the company for about 150 thousand dollars. And um, of the 15 people we got introduced to, I think about, you know, we got introduced over email. I think about six, seven, or eight of them didn't even reply to the email, so we never heard from them again. About seven or eight replied of those. Half of them said, this doesn't fit my investment thesis, which is weird because their investment thesis was like consumer internet companies. We were consumer internet, so I assume that we fit their, their thesis, but we didn't. Or they said the market wasn't big enough. One person said, I'm just not excited about travel as a category. So we're like, okay. And then we, <laughs> we ended up meeting... Um, a few more investors, and they all pass on us. The low point was we ended up launching in August 2008. We meet with uh, the angel Mike Maples, and we decided I was so cocky, I said, I'm not even bringing a deck. I'm just going to show them the live website. We launched that day on, uh, on TechCrunch. We have 10,000 people visit our website. I go there without a deck. I have a website. I type in the website. It doesn't work. So I basically sat in front of him for like an hour, and I didn't know what to say. I'm trying to explain him this concept, and he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> So, I mean, needless to Mike's say, never told me that story. yeah, 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 it was pretty <laughs> embarrassing. And always have a deck, like, as a backup yes. if your website goes down, or at least don't let your website go down yeah. if you're meeting an investor and it's like the last money you have. So, you know, those, like, you know, those binders that kids used to put baseball cards in those sleeves? We put credit cards in them. We probably, I probably went um, 30000 in credit card debt. Like, I got, I get credit cards, like a typical $5,000 max, and I would just keep getting credit cards. The company stopped giving me credit cards. And Joe did the same thing. And, you know, we went, tens of thousands of dollars in credit card debt. We ended up launching for the Democratic National Convention, though, and we were able to, so 2008, what, what was like the number, we had this basic idea, 
We need to get people to talk about us. And we had this thing called the chicken and egg problem. How do you get guests come without homes? Well, you can't get homes if there's no guests. And how do you get them at the same time? And how do you do that on a travel website where you can't just focus on one city because people go to other cities, so you have to focus on cities all over the world at the same time. And basically, the thing we thought is we need to get a ton of press so it's like the spontaneous combustion at the same time. And so we thought maybe events, higher profile versions of the founding event. And she thought, what's a high profile event? And we thought the Democratic National Convention. Barack Obama was coming to Denver. There were 80,000 people coming, or there was an 80,000 seat football stadium, and they had 27,000 hotel rooms. We thought, wow, there's an opportunity here. Plus, it's very grassroots. And we contacted New York Times, CNN, and they thought, like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. No one's ever going to stay with other people. So we ended up just like reaching out to the local newspapers. They ignored us. And we had this idea. Why don't we just start by getting anyone to write about us? And we felt like if some people write about us, other people would refer to them. So we literally started with bloggers. I wouldn't be surprised if like some middle school student wrote about us for the school paper. But if we literally got like bloggers to write about us. Then people would Google like DNC. They would see us come up because all these bloggers wrote about us. Then the local newspapers would write about us. And eventually we worked our way up until CNN New York Times got it. It started getting traction, but we were still in debt. We got like 80 bookings or maybe less for the Democratic National Convention. We got one or two bookings for Republican National Convention. That did not work out too well. And then the following weekend, we got like no bookings. And we realized if only there were political conventions every week, we'd have a business. But we have nothing. So this is now almost a year into the business. We're tens of thousands of dollars in credit card debt. Every investor said no to us. We've launched three times. We've gotten national press. And we have like almost no customers every single day. And now my, one of my co-founders decides he's moving to Boston, he's getting engaged, and his uh, fiance is maybe not interested in living in the West Coast, and it was unclear if we were going to stay together as a founding team. And these were, this was, everyone hits rock bottom. For me, this was rock bottom. We're totally in debt. We don't know what to do. We're desperate. Late at night, it's midnight, when you won the morning, and Joe and I think maybe we're airbed and breakfast. The airbeds aren't working out. Maybe we could sell breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone needs to eat. So we thought, let's just get in the breakfast business. <laughs> so we ended up making, we weren't going to make eggs, you know, so we decided let's make cereal. So we started making breakfast cereal. And we made presidential themed breakfast cereal. We made a Barack Obama themed cereal. We called it Obama O's, the breakfast of change. And we created Cat McCain themed cereal, or John McCain themed cereal. We called it Cat McCain's, a maverick in every bite. And we literally handcrafted our own cereal boxes. And we basically used it to gin up press and also, frankly, desperation. And I hadn't been eating at this point, so I was probably also starting to get slightly delirious. But we, and we called General Mills. They were like, what are you talking about? We're, are you seriously think we're going like, to make like, unlicensed presidential themed cereal? We're like, OK, I guess you won't. And so then we called these medium-sized cereal companies. They're like, great, just send us a non-refundable check for like $200,000. And we're like, OK, that's not going to work. So we found this guy in Berkeley. He was a uh, alumni of RISD. He says, I can't print you 100,000 boxes of cereal, but here's what I'll do. I'll print you 1,000 boxes of cereal for free. Just give me a royalty. We're like, thank you. One day, Joe comes back with 1,000 pieces of giant cardboard. I'm like, what the hell is that? He's like, this is cereal boxes. They were just pieces of cardboard we had to fold and glue into boxes. No one told me that. <laughs> so to fund the company, we basically folded like giant origami 1,000 boxes of collectible extra cereal, had to pack cereal in them, and we sold them for $40 a box. We thought, who was going to pay $40 a box? But they were limited editions. So we hand-numbered every one. We called it limited edition. And we ended up selling like $30,000 of cereal. And um, that's actually how we funded the company. And now we have a core value. It's called Be a Cereal Entrepreneur with Cereal to see. <laughs> I know it's a bad joke. but um, And that's basically how we started. And we were. this is the last part of the story. The last part of the story is, it was November 2008. We, were <laughs> we got back to almost broke. It's a more than a year in. We've launched three times. We've been on the national press. We have only a couple customers a day. Everyone says, this is, cra this is crazy. I told one, mem one, one mentor of mine about this business. He said, Brian, I hope that's not the only idea you're working on. You know, my mom said, like, if you need money, you don't need to have strangers stay in your home. Let me send you money. So people are very worried. And you start wondering about the decisions you've made in life to get here. So I could tell you I didn't feel like successful or smart or talented at this moment. I felt like the world was against me. I would go to sleep with my heart pounding every night. I'd wake up like wide awake, like what am I going to do? How am I going to get through the day? We have no money. And a bunch of people recommended we go into Y Combinator. And we were kind of like, well, we've already launched. We're like way beyond that. We're like, 
you're dying. And we're like, okay, I guess we're not beyond anything if we're dying. And so we meet with Paul Graham, Y Combinator, and he thought the idea was absolutely terrible. In fact, he said, people are actually doing this? And I said, yeah. And the second question was, what's wrong with them? And I said, oh shit. So this is, I thought this was a really bad interview. But um, by the end of the interview, Joe hands him a box of Obama O's. And Paul Graham thought we just bought this stupid box of cereal. And he's like, no, this is how we fund the company. And Paul Graham said, if you can convince people to buy, pay $40 for a $4 box of cereal, maybe you can get strangers to stay in other strangers' homes. And he also liked us because he said we were cockroaches. And he said, it's an investment nuclear winter, and the only people that will survive are cockroaches, and you're a cockroach. <laughs> and so I'm like, thank you. It was actually the nicest thing. For like six months, that was the only compliment I got, was I was a cockroach. And I remember calling my mom, like, Mom, I'm a cockroach. I got in. So that's how we got into Y Combinator, and that kind of was a turning point for us. Yep. And so, uh, but Y Combinator itself didn't make the numbers change. What was the thing that you did, or the couple of things that you did that changed the inflection? There were, there were two, th is this the one? Yeah. Sorry. There were two things. Um, the first thing was what Y Combinator did was it basically created a structure for us to work on it full time and live together. So in other words, we were all kind of working on it, but it was like everyone had other things going on in their life. And I think the enemy of a startup is everyone else's life. It's true. Like you have life and you have vacations and you have conferences and you go away and you do other stuff. And it's like that is the enemy of a startup. Um, you know, Paul Graham used to say startups don't die, they just fade away. And so... Um, you know, we basically decided for three months, Nate would move from Boston to San Francisco, and we'd wake up at 8 o'clock, we'd go to bed at midnight, seven days a week, and we'd work from 8 to midnight every single day. And seven days a week, you know, we'd get full night's sleep, but that was it. And we would, uh, in that dedication for three to four months, created this real serious rhythm where we weren't doing other things. We were totally focused. That was the first thing. The second thing was Paul Graham I, 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 think that's, I think the second thing was Paul Graham gave us a series of advice that probably changed our business forever. Um, probably the most important single piece of advice I got, which is probably advice that, is probably the most important advice I can give you, or one of the most important advice, is he basically drew out this chart, and he basically said, it's better to have 100 people that love you, 100 customers that love you, than a million customers that just sort of like you. In other words, if you have 100 people that absolutely love your product, they'll tell 100 people, and then they'll tell 100 people, or even 10 people, and this thing will grow. We call it growing virally. In fact, almost all movements in history have grown this way as well. There's like deeply passionate followers, and they grow it, and they're customer advocates. And the problem is in Silicon Valley, the general wisdom is, I need to build some app, this thing, and he's have his viral coefficient. I need to get millions of people to use it, and they gotta like it enough to share it. And that's totally the wrong way to think about it, especially if you're in a service business like ours. So Paul Graham said, all you have to do is get 100 people like you. Don't worry about millions of people. That was totally freeing. Because until then, I'm like, how the hell am I going to get a million people to do this if I can't even get my mom or my sister to do it? But I can, get, I can find 100 people. And so we literally decided, do things that don't scale. If you, all you need to do is get 100 people to love you, do things that don't scale. It turns out 100 people that love you is really hard because it's easy 100 people to like you. 100 people to love you means you need to meet them. You need to understand their problem. And so we literally would fly during Y Combinator from Mountain View. We commuted from Mountain View to New York. We would go, Joe and I would go to New York, and we'd go door to door because New York was where most of our community was. We would meet with every one of our hosts, and we'd live with them. We literally would live with them. We'd write the first reviews for the places. And in fact, I would go there, and I'd be like, wow, the photos are terrible. This is actually a really nice house. And the host is like, well, I can't figure out how to get photos onto my computer. This is before really the iPhone and high quality camera. They, this is just like people had to plug a camera into their laptop. And she thought, what if you just clicked a button and a photographer next day would magically show up and photograph your home? And they thought that'd be amazing. And so I went home with Joe and we borrowed a camera from one of our friends in Brooklyn like, who was a photographer and we knocked on the door and they're like, hello, yes, I'm here, the photographer. And they're like, wow, this is a small company. The founder's also photographing my home. <laughs> I used to also carry a bank ledger in my backpack, and if you need to get paid, I would just like rick about the check and I'd knock on your door and hand you a check. So um, that was also a reminder of how small we were. But the point was that doing things that don't scale, if you just think about go, b building something that even just one person loves, it's super easy to create something a single person loves, especially if it's a service. And then you go door, like person by person. Once you have 100 people, then you just focus on figuring out how to scale that. And it's a totally different intellectual problem to scale something 100 people love than figure out 
in uh, what, what that is. And that was a turning point for us. And so by April of 2009, we had hundreds of people that loved us. People started booking, and it became clear there was a real business here. And we, Paul Graham said, you have to be ramen profitable by demo day. Demo day is the end of Y Combinator when everyone presents to investors. Well, he said, the beginning of 2009, it wasn't clear there'd be any investors. Sequoia Capital had put out this slide deck, RIP Good Times. That was like the worst possible thing for me to see at the time. Like, what do you mean good times? Like, these were, these, this last year has been the worst year of my life. What do you mean the good times are over? What's the next year going to be like? So, because it wasn't good the year before. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what this means. Um, and it, what it meant was Paul Graham said there may be no, he actually told us this. He said, there may be no investors at Demo Day. Can you imagine that? A white commenter, there may be zero investors at Demo Day. And so if you want to defer a batch, because there may be no investors, you can. And we decided, well, we can't defer. We're going to die. And so St. Paul said, Graham said, well, there might not be investors. So if you're profitable, you never need to get funding. And so we decided, let's be ramen profitable. Ramen profitable means you're profitable if you just live on ramen. And I'm like, well, that's more than I'm living on now. So that's totally fine. And so by April, we were ramen profitable. And Sequoia Capital invested $600,000. And at the time, that was like a pretty big deal to get Sequoia Capital to invest. They hadn't invested in many, they invested in LinkedIn, but like they invested in Google, PayPal, so we're like, oh my God, like it was a huge legitimization event for us. And I think at that point, the rest was kind of, I don't want to say history because we're going to talk about what happened next, but that was the moment at least the product market fit happened. And then it went from building a product to kind of building a company. And how did you start getting to, like you had a, an, this initial community in New York, you actually got to know your customers very well, so you understood photography was key for yeah. unlocking the marketplace. You understood getting the host connected in really yep. well was unlocking the marketplace. Yep. How did you start then moving to many cities? So the really uh, unexpectedly great thing about our business was it was this word network effect I think gets kind of bastardized and it's unclear if it means anything anymore because everyone says they're a network effect. But we truly were a network, and I'll tell you how it happened. So we launched in New York, or we didn't even launch. I mean, we launched anywhere that you could access the internet, basically, and there was Google Maps. But New York was the big city we launched in. The thing is that we were a travel product in New York, which meant, unlike other companies where the supply and demand, like Uber, the drivers and riders in New York. On Airbnb, the hosts were in New York, but the travelers came from all over the world. So people all over the world would hear about and discover homes in New York. They would travel to New York, and they'd also travel to San Francisco, and then they'd go back to their city, and they'd spread the idea. But the other thing is they would go from a guest to a host. And so the network naturally grew, um, but we also targeted events. So, you know, um, we targeted the Democratic National Convention. We built at D.C. through the inauguration in 2009. Um, we built, um, we were focused on music festivals and concerts. So uh, the World Cup, the Olympics, these are early, not the most recent one, but the one before. So events in PR were probably the main ways that we bootstrapped. And then we built this one-click post to Craigslist tool that Craigslist allows to do until they shut it off like a couple years into it. But we allowed hosts to basically, we built a tool where they could, with a single click of a button, click and distribute their post to Craigslist to get more distribution. And so the listings would get relisted onto Craigslist and then we feed back. We started doing a little bit of Google advertising. But the main way it grew was through word of mouth and PR. And PR we, we used to promote the events. We didn't have any partnerships. Like we tried to partner with event companies. We tried to partner with, like partnerships in your early stage company, I found never work because there's so much red tape and paper that by the time you ever get done, you're like dead. And so, but PR is super, like if you've got an idea that's noteworthy, people will talk about it. And, and almost the more absurd the idea, in some ways the better, because it's worth writing about. Like it was absurd people were doing this, so they couldn't stop writing about it. And so that was actually a, a good thing. It being kind of a provocative idea, it was good to get the word out. And then we thought, if, if we just get enough people to use it, they'll tell everyone else about it. And so this idea primarily grew through word of mouth. And then we would go to cities, and then we would educate the host. We'd do these meetups. So we'd go to a city and we'd like, we call it turning on a market. We would do a meetup. We'd meet the 10 or 20 hosts. We'd educate them. But the other thing is that in San Francisco or here at Stanford, it's not novel for you to meet somebody who started a website. That's like not a big deal. And you just have like 15 people come talk to you. You go to like Boston. You go to like Austin, Texas. You go to San Diego. And most people don't go through their day-to-day -day like meeting a person who built the product they've used. It's very novel. And if they like the product, they want to go meet that person. And so you're in town. So we literally went city by city. We went to Paris. We went to London. We'd meet the host. We'd educate them. And then one thing we didn't realize is they would get so excited they met us and they thought they were 
reasonably nice people that they would tell their friends about it and their friends would start doing it and they get more engaged. We notice after you meet us, you would get more engaged. And then we'd also photograph your home, give you tips. And so these markets started turning on and then we kept getting press. We kept having some funny Obama O's type stunt to get people to keep talking about it. And we just religiously like focused on making sure customers really loved us. And we felt like if you loved us, you would tell more of your friends and eventually it would grow. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, I think that's the, the great warm-up story. Yeah. Now getting the scale. Oh my God, I'm just warming up. Holy <laughs> yeah, shit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> oh, it's, it, it's the canonical ideal yep. one. Um, so let's, let's first start with a couple of things that uh, you guys do very uniquely from all the other consumer internet. So, um, for example, because you and Joe are designers, you have an attention design that's much more intense even then. my socks, if you notice. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, but you have this concept of seven-star design. Yep, yep. So, uh, yeah, so the, the concept is, goes as follows. Um, on, on, the, on the internet, um, I bet you most marketplace businesses, um, the kind of paradigm is five stars, right? So a YouTube video, Airbnb, or Uber, or whatever, it's five stars. And the problem with five stars is five stars, like the only reason you would leave less than five stars is because it was horrible. So like if you if you rate like an Uber ride like four stars like your life might have been in danger right and so like 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 in other words the bar to do five stars is really low on Airbnb the bar is like people actually do leave four and three star reviews but our goal wasn't to get to a five star because a five star might have been nice enough for people other people to book it but we wanted to build a product where it was you loved it so much you would tell everyone about it and it would have a meaningful impact on your life. And we believe that travel has the impact to transform your life. Like, I've taken trips and I've met people where it has an impact on your life, and we wanted to have that. And so we thought, what if you booked an Airbnb and we sold you a product, and you didn't leave five stars, but you emailed the company asking for a six star, because the product was so good you had to almost go above and beyond. And so we imagined, when we designed products, we imagined, okay, this is what customers expect. They expect to have a five star experience. And then we basically ask the intellectual question. So let's take airport pickup, for example. What's a five-star like, like check-in experience on Airbnb? The five-star check-in experience is you, 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 they give you the address, you get to the house, you knock on the door, and they're there. And they open the door and they let you in the house. And that's five-star. And anything worse than that, you start to leave like four stars as you call them. They're like five minutes away, and you'll probably leave a four star. And like one star is obviously like they never showed up. So the bar is kind of low. Like you knock on the door and they pick, they open the door. That's a really low bar. So we ask, well, what's a six star? Well, a six star is they probably pick you up at the airport. So you don't knock on their door. They actually pick you up at the airport. So what's a seven-star review? You can actually play. It's kind of fun. Well, seven stars, they don't pick at the airport. They send a limousine, and you open the limousine door, and they know that you like, um, I don't know, Pringles. That was a, sorry, that was a weird example. But this is all, this is like, this is like improv, so we're, we're growing with it. So there's Pringles there, and there's like coconut water, and they, like, they know you are into surfing, and there's some surfing magazine. Even though you're in San Francisco, you're not going to surf. That's fine. And so that's a seven-star. So what's an eight-star uh, pickup? Well, an eight-star um, check-in is, um, you know, there's a, like, you know, you get to the airport, and you th they're, like, they're like, we're coming, and they're like, where are you? And all of a sudden, you see, like, a giant elephant, and an elephant is walking by the gate, the terminal, and there's a parade in your honor, and you get on top of the elephant, and you are paraded away. <laughs> and you said, well, what's, what's a nine-star check-in? If that's an eight-star check-in, how do we get to nine stars? A nine-star check-in is you get off the plane, and you don't even you, you, the moment you step off the plane, there are 5,000 screaming 13-year-old women and boys, and they're holding signs. I call it the Beatles check-in. It's the Beatles in 1964 coming to America, and they're just cheering for you, screaming for you, and you basically, they follow you, and they do a press conference in the front yard of your Airbnb. And so then what's a 10-star check-in? Well, <laughs> I can go to 30, but I won't, because um, it'll be a long day. And the 10-star the, the is you... You, um, you, you, you get to the airport, and um, there's a little card, and it's got your name on it, and you're like, great, there's my ride, but you realize the person dressed in the limo suit is Elon Musk, and he just takes you to space. <laughs> and so I, I, I've, exa I've exaggerated to make a point. Usually we don't go all the way to 10, but the whole point is that like, if, you, if, if what you need to do is just find 100 people to love you, 
then it's very easy to take for granted that the five star is what people expect. But to build something people love, you almost need to do something more than they expect. And so like every moment is an opportunity to do something slightly more than people expect. And you, you, we play this out, you go to like all the way to 10. Okay, now we're not gonna do all that, but let, maybe suddenly six stars doesn't seem so bad. Like now we should have a service, airport pickup or something like that. And so we do this about almost every frame of the experience. And this also can apply to almost anything, office design or like how you hire people. Like, you know, we storyboard end to end the interviewing experience. I think one other thing in your seven star design principle that you haven't yet captured, which is really important is it's not just the web page. It's oh, not yeah. just the mobile app. Yes. Yeah, I think one time I told somebody about our product. In fact, I, I, there's a person who works for an uh, executive at Disney. I'm like, yeah, we have a product team. And he thought, a product? He said, product, do you mean like the house? And at Airbnb, we, we've historically called the product like the website and the applications, the technology. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. See, at Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg calls the product the website or the app. But it, I act technically speaking, the product is whatever the customer is buying. The customers are not buying our website and they're not buying our application. That's just a storefront of communication. What they're buying is a house. And frankly, what they're buying more than a house is the host experience of hospitality, this idea of belonging. And so we realized very early on that we are um, an online to offline business. In fact, in China, they call it O to O, online to offline. But we kind of started, I don't know if you could, I think the sharing economy, we're kind of like a next wave of the internet. So the, there was a wave of the internet, things online, Amazon, books online. There was another wave of internet thing connecting together, LinkedIn, Facebook. But then there's another wave of the internet, the internet going back into the real world. And Airbnb was one of those examples. And so we started storyboarding the experience and realizing it's really about every moment of the experience. And we have to be responsible, not just for the online part of the product, but the offline part of the product. And so that's what we did. So uh, as a bridge to um, uh, getting to how you also design culture, I think it's worth sharing with people how you um, also apply design to the office yes. as part of embodying culture. Yeah, so um, I think that there's, I think, I feel like there's all these things. Well, let, let me back up and say, before I say that, let me say this. Um, I, I consider myself a designer by trade, but I think a designer, you know, Steve Jobs used to say, designer, design isn't how something looks, it's how something works. And I think when you realize design's how something works, you imagine almost everything needs thought and design. That you don't just design a website or an application, you design everything. You design a company. And you design your organization, you design your buildings, everything. And so we started thinking, once you realize everything can be designed, then you don't have to pull everything out of a box and plug it in. In other words, you don't need, your company doesn't need to look like every other company. Everything could be reinvented. Now, not everything should be reinvented. You shouldn't reinvent management and HR systems. But there are some basic things that might be core to you should reinvent. And for us, we decided the space we work in should be reinvented. First of all, our core competency was showing cool space around the world. We better have a cool space. And I also realized early on that a really cool, interesting space would be a huge differentiator to hire people and that you would spend more time in your office than you will in your home. And so it was deeply important that people were comfortable and happy. And so that was the kind of hypothesis. And I think it's pretty much a no-brainer, but I think that it's a moment that people completely take for granted. It's totally a afterthought. And I said, that's great that it's an afterthought for everyone else. It's going to be a competitive advantage for us. And one of the things we decided was, how, do, how can we reinvent the office? And there were like 100 ideas, but I'll just give you one of them. In our, one of the offices we had, you walk in a lobby, and there were photos of our homes around the world. And so you go to this lobby, and I remember people were like just walking in the lobby, looking at all these homes. They're like, oh, these are awesome. And I thought, I couldn't figure it out, but I thought, there's got to be a better way than just showing photos of our homes. And I couldn't figure it out. One day, I'm walking home. I'm walking from my house to, uh, I'm walking down the street. And I pass a, f a furniture store, and it's late at night. And the furniture store is like lit up. They light it up at night. And it's like, and there's a, like a, a four to ceiling window. And I just look in, and it's a showroom. They basically recreated these rooms. And it was hilarious. I thought it'd be really funny just to have a meeting in that, like in a showroom. And in fact, the next day I took somebody to a meeting in the showroom, and we like, were hanging out in a dining room of like a furniture store. But you feel like you're in a living room. It was actually, and it was actually kind of fun. It was kind of absurd. You're like having a meeting in Ikea, but it was actually kind of fun. And suddenly we realized, what if all of our meeting rooms were actually 
modeled piece by piece after apartments on our website. And we ended up doing that. And so I remember one time we emailed somebody. We said, hey, can I... Um, do you mind if we recreate your home in our office? And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, all I need is an inventory of everything in your home. And so some people did it, and we literally recreated their, our, our, uh, the, the rooms. So you go there, our meeting rooms are literally homes. You walk into, like showrooms of our homes. It's a subtle little reinvention. It doesn't cost a lot of money because people's homes, th the furniture they put in is actually cheaper than most office furniture. It's really creative. And we have tens of thousands of people a year who fly or come to our office to tour our office now. And, it's be and our office has become a huge competitive advantage in hiring, and people like to stay over. But that's just like a tiny example where almost everything is a creative opportunity. And that was actually one of the ones that I was like, oh my god, this is a great idea. Because part of what you're trying to do and when you create a culture is you're trying to create a norm of what are we all focused on, what are we doing? Yes. And tactile visual. Yes. Here it is. Yes. Is awesome. <laughs> it's so critical that there's no dissonance between what's inside the building and what's outside the building. And I remember I've been to some companies before. Like I'm one time I went to this travel company, this travel magazine, and I imagined their, their office being this awesome place. And I don't know what I imagined, but I got there. It was gray. It was drop ceilings, cubicles, and you could have put any logo in the front, and it could have been literally any company. And I thought people need to be in the mindset of your product. And so you have to put your product in the building. People need to be immersed in the world because they're working in that world. And so when they work for you, this kind of like th they're working in the center of the universe. The center of the universe of your business needs to be the most potent. And the problem is in most companies, it's the least potent. It's like just gray with drop ceilings and cubicles. And so I thought that was a huge opportunity to reinvent. And we've now had a lot of like CEOs and other people come to our office to get inspiration even as of, as of last night, I was showing somebody around. Well, it certainly had that effect for me, too. Actually, before we get to design and culture, that actually also brings up one other point that I think is useful. Um, you spent, I think it was nearly a year, yes. living in Airbnb. Yes. Why don't you say a little bit about why you did that and what you learned from it? I did it out of kind of necessity, but um, so here's the thing. When we started Airbnb, we started in our three-bedroom apartment, and we started working on the apartment. And unlike most companies, most companies, when they start hiring, they find an office space. And we decided we were going to work out of our apartment indefinitely. In fact, originally, we were inspired by Craigslist, who works in a house. We thought, maybe we can put 100 people in a house. We didn't do that, thankfully. But um, we started working, and we hired people so quickly, we couldn't find an office in time. At one point, we had, I think, 15 or 17 people working out of a three-bedroom apartment. We literally had meetings in the bathroom and on like, the stairwell. It was kind of odd. You know, you should, by the way, never interview someone in the bathroom. It's apparently like a huge violation. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, but, but, um, but um, at some point, like, we, we had no space. So we turned our bedrooms into meeting rooms. And I said, I'm just going to give my bedroom over to the company. You guys can turn it into a meeting room, and I'll find a place to stay. And my first instinct was, well, where do I go? Like, we never built the roommate site, so I'll go to roommates.com. I'll go to Craigslist. And then, I don't know, for some reason, I thought, wait a second why the hell will I go on Craigslist? We have like thousands of homes here in San Francisco. Maybe I can rent one for the month or a couple months. And then I thought, wait a second, why don't I just, it'd actually be kind of fun if I stayed in them for a few nights each and I actually could test them and I could travel without leaving my city. And so I ended up doing this, I thought for a few weeks, turned into a few months, turned into almost a year, I think it was like 10 or 11 months, where I would stay in a different home every like three to five nights. And people were like, where are you from? I'm like three blocks away. And they're like, <laughs> wait a second, what's going on right now? But it was, this no, it was this huge message of the company. And the message of the company was, this is not a job, this is, this is not even a career, this is a calling, this is a passion. And I think a strong culture is when people believe and feel in what you're doing. And they're not, you know, there's this old parable about two men, they're laying bricks. A guy comes up to one man, he goes, what are you building? He goes, I'm building a wall. He asks the other person, what are you building? He goes, I'm building a cathedral. Um, I think Simon Sinek wrote about it. But it's the idea that you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not building financial systems. You're not building a website. You're not designing, you know, um, you know you're, not, you're not designing different screens and mock-ups. You're building this mission. You're creating this kind of world. And that's only possible if you're constantly using the product. And even if you're a travel company, you can be living and breathing the product. And I always felt like 
Every one of us has to be a product person. You can't be a business person. You're a product person first and foremost. And product needs a rule, and the product is the thing you're selling. And so we need to be deeply passionate, all of us, about everything that we're doing with the product. And it really told people in the company, you should use the product when you travel. You should use product when you're home. You should be hosting, and you should become an expert in every part of your product. And the number of people I see that work at some big companies where they, they are so disconnected from the end customer, those are the companies that get disrupted. Uh, okay, so the last piece on the uh, kind of, well, there's a lot of things that are unique about Airbnb, but the last thing from the point of view of the class before we get to the scaling part of it, designing culture. Yep. So part of the reason why we started with the you know, role modeling of you as CEO, what you did as the office, those were two of the elements. But what are the other things? Because the design of the culture was one of the things that, you know, I see you put more energy into than any other young entrepreneur. Yeah, I um. A culture, first of all, like culture I define as like a shared way of doing things. And so that's it. And I think there's no, I don't think there's necessarily good and bad cultures. I mean, you could argue there are cultures that are bad. That's usually subjective. I think there's weak cultures and strong cultures. And what I consider a bad culture, some of us might consider a good culture, is just that's the way they do things. And I wanted to have a strong culture, a culture where everyone was on a mission, it was shared, and people were deeply passionate, and there was a set way that certain things were done. And there were like a series of beliefs that we all had, and there were a few governing ideas. And so I decided we wanted to have a strong culture. We ended up touring Zappos. Alfred Lin's on our board. He ran Zappos with Tony Shea. And we did a lot of research. And one thing I learned is... You know, a strong culture is a place where the founders, it's a founder-led culture, and it's where the founders really impose this kind of strong, like, kind of way of doing things that people buy into, and they're deeply passionate about being there. And again, it's not a job. Weak cultures, it's lame to hang out with your coworkers. Strong cultures, it's, it's totally natural. And so... The first thing I realized is the most important cultural event is every time you hire somebody. When you're starting a company, the most important cultural decisions you make are the people you surround yourself with. Um, the second most important is deciding when people aren't fits, removing them. Um, and there's a hundred other cultural decisions, but I think hiring is the most important thing to culture because you're bringing people in. And so the culture becomes the people around you. And so the main thing is the hiring. I decided to interview every single person, which is not crazy when you're five employees, but I think I hired, interviewed the first few hundred employees. I don't know what the number, but I remember like people were begging me to stop interviewing employees. And about a year after that point, they started begging. I actually did stop interviewing every employee. But I literally would interview every employee. And today, um, when you interview Airbnb, you have to go through like functional or technical interviews. So if you're an engineer, you go through engineering interviews or functional interviews. But you also have to go through culture interviews. And everyone goes through two. We have two people because sometimes you know you make the wrong decision. So we have two people, and the people are basically testing for like six core values. I'll give you like one example. One of our core values is to be a host. So they're passionate about the notion of giving and hospitality. And you can kind of tell by their life and their background if they are or not passionate about it. It's deeply hard to not be a host in your DNA and want to work at Airbnb and be successful. It kind of is a weird thing. So you get to learn these things. So these are just some of the things. We created a core values council. It almost sounds like an absurd thing to say um, at most companies. I don't know anyone else that really does that kind of stuff. Core values council, it's about... 12 people that are experts in the values and the culture, and they're kind of this kind of advisor group to everyone in the company. So people aren't sure if this is the way to do something or not, or I don't know if this is something that feels on brand or not. You can kind of book office hours with these people and they can give you some feedback. And, you know, so this is kind of some of the stuff we do. We try not to be overly dogmatic about culture. Like, I think it can go too far where there's, like, a set way of doing things you can never reinvent. So the things have to be timeless and more fundamental, not like... This is how we make presentations. That's not culture. Culture are like beliefs that should never change under any technological conditions. And how do you, uh, I mean, obviously you got a huge uh, drive to that by personally getting it and then evolving it into a practice that includes a cultural interview. What are the kinds of things that as you begin to hit the scale? Because that's yeah. the precise thing that one of the things that yeah, is at risk scale. Yeah. So you have to basically be relentlessly doing cultural things every week. And so I do as many cultural things as I used to do, but now they're no longer person to person. Um, the main leverage points I have now, culture, is having people do things f on my behalf. We, we, you would call it leverage. They're doing it for you. Um, so in the early days, I did all the interviews. Then I trained people. I pan-picked people, and I said, you should do the interviews. 
and here's who you interview for. So I spent days with them showing them how to interview. So then they started interviewing. Then we had all these people, and so I had to create an inner circle that trained those people. Um, I used to meet every single employee and f- give them a personal orientation. Then I started doing weekly orientations to groups of people. And now we recorded it all because we hired people all the world. And so we've institutionalized this whole onboarding week with all, and we curate all the videos and stories. I do the Sunday night email series. I think you've seen some of the emails. Every Sunday night, I write an email to the company that's not really a tactical email, but like a more like kind of above the trees, kind of fairly thought-provoking kind of cultural email. Because I find that if on your first day you say something to somebody, they kind of remember, but then like 100 people said 100 things after that. So you have to continue to repeat things. So I think culture is about repetition. It's about repeating over and over and over again the things that really matter at a company. And then it's about trying to design as many things, like the space. When, when you check in, there's a key card, and when you check your key card above, it says champion the mission. It's one of the values, which is like, and it reminds you every day to do that. So there's a lot of subtle things that we do. Um, and I think it's like that touch point. Like, what is every moment that can be designed to reinforce how you want, like, people to value things? And it all can be designed. I think culture, some people I've heard, when I wrote this blog post, it was based on what Peter Thiel said, called Don't Fuck Up the Culture. Because I asked Peter Thiel's advice, and he said, Don't Fuck Up the Culture. And I'm like, oh, has it has happened? But the way you don't fuck up the culture is by focusing on it and designing it. I've heard people giving it a counterpoint. There's devil's advocate, which is to say, cultures are organic, they shouldn't be designed, and when they're designed, they're like fake and sloppy, and I actually don't believe that, because most people who've created cultures organically wake up with a culture they don't usually love. Now, it doesn't mean you control everything they do. The whole point of culture is you control only a few things, like everyone here is a host. And I'm not gonna tell you how to act, but I'm gonna tell you everyone here has to be hospitable, and that I'm gonna impose on everyone. If you don't like it, go somewhere else. So and you pick just a few things. You can't pick like everything because then you're like big brother. Yep. No, well, it's, it's culture is the norms that define that what is, what is the team that we're playing on and what is the winning condition. Yes. And how do we hold each other accountable, not through a hierarchy, but through a community. Yes, that's they, right. Each other. Yes. Yeah, and they work really well through like peer accountability. Yeah. No, and that's, that's why it's key. And, and, and as I was mentioning before the class, Reed Hastings also went into this um, yeah. a couple weeks ago. Um, so let's go to the challenges of scale. Uh, so, so now, you know, uh, a, long, uh, a substantial time in the wilderness, yes. you know, inventing Obama O's yes, and yes. cereal, moving yeah. on to the breakfast part of it. And then financing, uh, beginning to get customers to love you, beginning to get a network effect by yep. which guests would come and then co be host and yep. then be spreading the yep. world. And so now you've begun to hit your product market fit and you've begun to scale yep. it. What were the things that started changing for you that you had to now learn now that you were scaling? Oh, um, the first one was a long list. Yeah, um, first one was hiring, and um, I think hiring, hiring, and then management of the people that you hired, and that that still like still that that uh, starting in like mid two thousand eight until today that probably became and is sustained to be the most important thing. And when you're just starting, other than picking the right co-founders, which is also kind of like the most important thing, it, it sees to be important. So before product market fit, other than your co-founders, I find the people around you weren't the most important because you and your co-founders presumably can do most of the work, and it's just really on you to figure out almost everything. And so I found before product market fit, I did everything. And I, did, I literally did everything but code. I did everything. And then post-product market fit, you do very little except manage, create a vision, and hire people. And so suddenly you shift. And you go from building the product to building the company that builds the product. Well, the company is mostly the people. And so I had to figure out how to find great people, attract them, recruit them. And then the craziest thing is once you hire these people, like, what do I do now? i got to manage them. How do you manage somebody? Like, what does that even mean? I, I, I'd, never, I'd never been managed or managed somebody in my life. I mean... I worked at a company before, but in hindsight, I don't think I was managed very closely. It was a small firm, and I kind of did my thing. Um, so I didn't, um, and I, I, I managed, I was, I was like a camp counselor, like at a hockey camp. That wasn't really management. There were like 12-year-olds, and I'd tell them how to skate. That wasn't really management. So I'm like, oh, God, I don't really know what management is. So, and you're managing people older than you, and that's also kind of weird. Like, oh, my God. And so at first, it's a really odd experience. And so you kind of learn partially through trial and error by like making tons of mistakes, like 
like like a classic management mistake is like people complain, so you immediately appease them. So you basically reward people to complain, and the people who don't complain like get disenfranchised, but they're not extroverted, so they just leave the company. Like there's just these little things that are kind of in hindsight intuitive, but they seem counterintuitive. And so I had to learn I think learning to hire and manage was one really big thing. I think learning how to um, move towards from an intuition to data informed. Because I think when you're starting and building a product, I think data is not the most important thing. I, I, mean, I know people do a lot of A-B tests to try to figure out a product. I really feel like pre-product market fit, f data is not the most important thing. Uh, and it wasn't for us. I mean, we, we were really going off of person-to-person -person interactions. And then you um, have to work on moving towards data information. So obviously A-B testing and cohorting and all these things that were completely foreign to me. Saying data, kind of building people, Thinking more long term, when you're a startup before product market fit, thinking long term seems preposterous because there may not be a long term. It's kind of like if you're dying, you're not thinking about how to, what you want to do when you grow up. You're going to think about how do I not die and like how do I plug this wound. So you kind of move out of this terminal. You, know, you start thinking more terminal. Um, I think uh, those are probably some of the big things. But there were, there were other things like actually having a plan, a roadmap, a strategy. Like, you don't have plans in a startup. You don't have strategies. You don't have roadmaps. Roadmaps the next two weeks, and suddenly, well, I've got three engineers. They got to know what to do for like the next three months. And so you start creating roadmaps. You start having a wish list. How am I going to get the word out? How am I going to expand? So things like yeah. that. Well, the overall thesis on blitz scaling, as you know, because <laughs> yeah. you're one of the people living it and doing it, is what got you here is not what will get you there. Right. And you're changing, like you used to be entirely very short-term focused, where the results this week, today, this month matter versus what's my year plan? Right. What what am I actually in fact trying to uh, happen, make happen one two years from today, totally. which changes the question of am I doing it myself or am I essentially uh, first hiring you know people then hiring managers then hiring executives yeah. and keeping a culture in the like all the game changes as you're going and it's so what got you here does not get you there. That's one of the weird things. It's kind of like there's this perception that when you start a company you grow a company. See, everyone, when they ask me at Airbnb, they always ask me about the founding days. They, it's as if like you have this idea, it takes off, and then you just got to find a way to manage it. And the truth is that so glosses over like all the other stages. Like the, you have like five stages. Stages two, three, four, and five are as complicated or more complicated as stage one. I mean, I think stage one is actually fairly straightforward. Like find, solve your own problem, do something that don't scale, find 100 people to love it, and have some really great co-founders that you trust. Make sure you are full stack designers and engineers in your founding team, ideally. And I mean, there's just some basic principles. I don't think it's that complicated. And if, even if it is, it's well written about. But the thing after that, there's like not a lot of books about. And everyone gives you the wrong advice. And you've got to figure it out. And you're kind of on your own. And the risk is, if I ask a CEO how to manage, and they work at a huge company, they're going to tell me the wrong thing. It's just like, you, you talk about like you're like skating, but it's not ice, it's water. It's like the ice skates don't work yet. So one of the, one, I, I first, we, we invited a, a, for, a CEO over, and he gave me this piece of advice I never forget. He said, every six months, you keep your job, it's a promotion. I almost think in hindsight, it's better to say every six months is a totally different job. So it's not like, it's not like this metaphor of you're an athlete, and you're like, I don't know, you're like a tennis player and you like play small tournaments and you work your way up. You start playing tennis, then you're like a bowler, then you're like a football player, and then you're playing hockey. Like the, sp it, the job changes so much, you're almost playing a different sport at every job. And this is why it's fairly, I don't know if it's rare, but it's hard to start a company, to be the right person to start a company and be the right person to manage it when it's a thousand people. Because it means you have to be different types of people. And it's totally different. Like at a large company, you have to be extremely strong at public, you usually have to be fairly strong at public speaking cause, or, in, or writing because that becomes your primary management tool. Like how do I speak to the company? I either write them an email or I say something in a video or in front of a bunch of people. In the early stage, you're around a kitchen table and it's four people. So your interactions are different. You, like, so just there's all these subtle things that like the skill sets start changing. The most important thing, I think, is being adaptable, because no one's an expert at everything. But you got to be very adaptable. And I've seen people who've been able to scale and people who haven't been able to scale. And I think there's two things that I've identified as being able to scale. One is just general intelligence and talent. Like, if you are, like, over your head when you start, you, it's hard to ever not be over your head. But the other thing is people who are kind of curious and adaptable. I found that, like, 
you know, Pablo uh, Picasso had a saying, he said, it took me four years to learn to paint like Raphael, but it took me a lifetime to learn to paint like a child. We have to kind of be kids at heart in startups, I find, in the sense that you're curious, you're open mind, you're welcoming, you're adventurous, and you're not a know-it-all. Know-it-alls will never scale in startups. So if somebody's a know-it-all, they know everything, so they'll never know more. So you're not gonna scale. That's kind of the way I think about it. So these are the things, and I've had to be that, and I've sought out your advice. And if you're not a know-it-all, you are shameless about getting feedback. And so I've had to surround myself with people much smarter than me, much more experienced than me, including Reed and many other people who've gone through what I haven't gone through yet. But you're right, it's, like, it's, not, even a, a, it's not even like you're slaying a different dragon, it's like a different sport. The term that I use for it is infinite learners, and you're actually one of the people I use as an example. Because oh, literally the very first time you and I did a press event, uh, you were the, it was the first time that I had done a press event with an entrepreneur in my portfolio where the very first question you asked me when we got off the stage was, what should I have done better? Yeah. It was literally, we walked out and it was like, what should I have done better? I'm like, you're the first time I've done this with somebody and it's the first time that's been the very first question. Yeah. Right? It was, yeah. uh, you know, anyway, infinite learner I think is actually, uh, is key for uh, managing the scale and the blitz scale. Um, international. Uh, uh, one of the things as you begin to scale, it changes competition. Oh, yeah. Right, so you got Wimdu yeah. in the early days. Yeah. How did that kind of change your notion of how you were playing when you began to see people being in the go, go from, oh, that's crazy, to, oh, that's essential, and we're all now trying to compete? Yeah, there's like a bunch of stages of startup. The first stage is, I think, survival, meaning like you're not meant to survive. So you start this company, you have this idea, and everyone's telling you're crazy, you can't get any money, you can't raise any money, you're co-founders, you don't even know if everyone's going to keep working on it. And so I call that like survival, and like not dying is working on it the next day. It's like, like no one actually kills you, you just fade away, you stop working on it. The second stage is probably like firefighting. And so then you like are firefighting, oh my God, we're growing, I need to hire these people, I don't know what to do. And then once you get through the survival and some of the initial firefighting, you've gained the luxury of having all these other people now decide to copy you and try to destroy you. So it's that now it's existential threats, true existential threats. And we had two, one was government, uh, government relations and the other was competitors. And I'll talk about competitors. Um, so we got to the point where we started getting successful only to have all these people basically copy us. Um, one day, it was early 2011, so about two years in from 2009 of it working. So 2009, 2010, it kind of was working. 2011, so we had two-year kind of honeymoon, or I don't know if I'll call it honeymoon, but like, and then suddenly, by the way, in 2010, somebody, uh, this guy Howard Hartenbaum, he's an investor at August Capital, he told me, he says, Whatever you do, all you gotta all you gotta make sure is these two brothers don't copy your website. <laughs> and I said, who? What two brothers? He goes, they're called the Samware brothers, and they're notorious. And usually, when they copy a website, they scale it and they kill you. And he's like, but he's like, don't worry though, because you're fine, because they haven't copied your website, and they probably, if they haven't by now, they won't. I'm like, thank God, we're free. All of a sudden, we notice people like we notice a lot of suspicious activity and people spamming our users. And we're like, something's up. We didn't know what's up. Turns out, we, uh, you know, we find out the Samware brothers um, have their eye on Airbnb. Now, I'll tell you how scary this was. In 2011, the hottest startup in the world was Groupon. They went from zero dollars to I think like a billion dollars in revenue in like a year or two. At the time, that was completely unheard of. Actually, it's still kind of unheard of. And um, Groupon grew that fast, not because of the U.S. business, but because of the European business, which was called City Deal. That was actually the Oliver Samware clone that Groupon had to buy. So basically, these two brothers, not only I was told would kill anyone that they cloned, they're like the attack of the clones, but <laughs> they also had built what was at least being positioned at the time the fastest growing, most successful startup of all time. That was how Groupon was positioned. That was not somebody that we were interested in, like fighting, right? Suddenly, like you're like this giant dragon appears, and you're like, this is not possible to beat him. And they and and now at this point, we'd raised seven million dollars, in fact, from you. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> and this we is where I enter yeah, the picture. So Reed, Reed had to give us seven million dollars, <laughs> and then suddenly, in 2010, I think, in April 2010, by January or February or March, some point 2011. They raised $90 million, and we had 40 employees, and it took us two and a half years to find these 40 people. And in 30 days, they hired 400 people, and they opened 20 offices. 
and I had no idea how you even open a second office. Like, <laughs> like we have one office. Where do I, how do I get a second office? Do I fly there? Do I like get an apartment? Do I get, and they had $90 million. And I was like, this is horrible. And they basically said, we're going to do in Europe what you did in the United States. Now, the problem with that is most companies, if they lose Europe, they're just a smaller company. In Airbnb, if you lose Europe, there is no Airbnb. A travel website where you can't travel to Europe is like a phone without email or phone without signal. It doesn't, there's no reason for it to exist. So this became a bet the company fight and we didn't know what to do. He had, we had a proposition to buy the company. It would have been very expensive, but more importantly, it would have been huge cost culturally. And I didn't know what to do. I remember I called up Mark Zuckerberg because they cloned um, Facebook, this Studivisette. Um, so I called up Andrew Mason. Andrew Mason told me, yeah, they're probably going to kill you. Um, <laughs> he, he, he had told me the story that Oliver, Oliver Samwer was so good at copying companies that he, it was too easy for him. He needed to turn it into a challenge. So he decided to hire developers from North Korea. And because uh, I, I, just because I, I, I don't know, and Andrew described it as because it was like he just wanted to make it more challenging to copy his company because it was too easy. I don't really believe that story, but um, th it was just, I, there was, in other words, there's all this mythology. Mark Zuckerberg told me, don't buy, don't let them sell. Whoever has the best product wins. And he ended up being right. I, I, Paul Graham gave me even better advice, though. He said, he said, you know, you're missionaries, they're mercenaries, and, um, you know, oftentimes missionaries often win. So he said, you should basically just pretend like they had this baby, but they don't want to raise the baby. And so I thought, well, we're founders. We want to grow this company. So I'm like a parent, and I want this child to, like, grow into this wonderful company. And so I said, uh, the way and say this to Oliver Sandler, but my view was my biggest punishment, my biggest revenge on you is I'm going to make you run this company long term. So you had the baby, now you got to raise the child, and you're stuck with it for 18 years. And and because I, I knew he wanted to sell the company, I'm like, no, no, you're running this company. Like, and I knew he could get, he could out he maybe could go move faster than me for a year, but he wasn't going to keep doing it. And so that was our strategy, and we built a company long term. And the ultimate way we won is we had a better community. He couldn't understand community. And I think we had a better product. And, yep. But it was a do or die time. And we ended up flying to Europe. We hired a bunch of country managers. We flew them all to San Francisco. And we basically trained them for a month or two. We said, now go to your country, hire your team. Here's how you open a market. Here's how you open cities. And we opened, I think, like eight or 10 offices in like three months. It was actually totally insane. We hired hundreds of people. And the whole speed of the company picked up at that point. And a couple years later, obviously, like, it was g game over. But Yeah, it was, the, it was one of the principal triggers for Airbnb going to blitz scale in the organization. Yeah, because we were not, we were, I think that was a, the first moment was Y Combinator where like we had this hustle of, if we aren't successful by any Y Combinator, we're probably going to stop, so we hustled. And then we started moving, but we aren't moving as fast. Then 2011, boom. Sam were, I mean, the gift he gave us was a scale fast. And he, like, he took a company that was kind of successful and he kind of compressed our time to becoming an international network effect within a year. And by the end of 2011, it was clear it was going to grow really fast. So two last questions before we go to a few questions from the audience. Um, the first one is, uh, the other one that triggered, obviously, was government regulatory. Yes. And uh, you and I both speak about this a lot, so yep. you can find it in detail and... YouTube and Google and news things. Because roughly speaking, this is the way the world should be. People yes. should have this kind of social belonging. People should be able to, you know, they, they can already rent the room to students. Right. They should be able to rent a bed. Yep. People should be able to connect with them. Yep. And obviously, we should make sure that this is this the social space, the neighborhood, that's all done the right way. Right. But give a little bit of character as kind of like, here's a, as we win the scale, here's how a unique challenge hits us. Oh, um, yeah, so... The problem with all these challenges is they always like hit you in the. It's like it's like you're walking down the street, someone just punches you in the side of your face, and you never saw them coming. And that's kind of what it felt like, like every one of these challenges. So Sam, were like hit us in the side of the face, and same thing happened in government relations. Um, we had a number of big problems. Um, the first problem I remember having was June 2010 when we got word that New York City was going to pass a law. They hadn't heard about Airbnb, but they were trying to go after this landlord that wasn't even on Airbnb that was converting apartments into like hotels without getting licenses. And we thought, uh oh, this is a problem because this might affect our users. Of course it did. 
And they said, oh, the city won't enforce against you. It's just an enforcement-based policy. Don't worry about it. And we're like, okay, we won't worry about it. So then a couple years later, um, we get an email or a call, actually a physical letter from the New York State Attorney General saying, well, actually there is this law and you are violating it or your users are violating it. And so we want the data of your users to enforce against thousands of people because we don't know if we're paying taxes and more importantly, we think they're breaking short-term rental laws. And so suddenly we're confronted with like these huge, potentially ominous challenges. And attorney generals are like very scary people. They actually like, you know, have quite a jurisdiction and they, you know, um, have reputations of putting people in jail, especially New York State attorney generals. His predecessor was Elliot Spitzer. So, um, and, he, and he was quite scary as attorney general. So you're like, you're just kind of, uh, and suddenly, like, you know, I remember us having conversations like, like, how do you know how to, f do you fight the attorney general or not? And like, how do you do that? And, you know, that, like, that I could tell you the details of how that fight happened, but I think you, it's more the principles that matter. I mean, the details were he wanted specific personal information on tens of thousands of users, many of whom weren't violating any rules. We thought, you know, anonymized data is one thing, but we're not just handing over, like, through for, so you can just discover rules people might be breaking. That's a fishing expedition. And we viewed that if we challenged them in court, we'd win. We challenged them in court, we did win. We eventually compromised on a narrow set of user data, which is not any different than a subpoena, which all, all companies basically apply, uh, um, um, comply with. But that was that was overly broad. It was like a fishing expedition, and so we didn't want to do that. But the bigger thing is, how do you learn how to deal with government relations? It was a huge challenge. We had a lot of trial and error. My first instinct in f uh, with, was to fight, to be like this fight for the people, mobilize people. In 2010, we wanted to do that. We staged a rally, a political rally. Like I, I, After I learned how to build a website, I had to learn how to stage political rallies. So we go to like New York City, go to City Hall, We'd like, and we'd give people signs and they'd help. And, and then we realized that's not really the right approach for us. We're a company where people are living together and we're trying to teach people that people are fundamentally good and they're living together. A company where people live together is not a good f company that has a brand of fighting. Because, I mean, the big fear is people are going to fight in their homes and so that. We're like, we need to be partners of cities and we want cities to know they love us. And so we decided, you know, we're going to kill them with kindness. In other words, we're going to show them that we want to be partners. And I also learned another lesson from government relations, which is I always had this instinct that if people don't like you, you should never talk to them. And somebody told me this saying, they said, it's hard to hate somebody up close. And so I kind of created this counterintuitive thing, which is that I will only, I'll meet everyone that hates me. And the goal isn't to make them hate me, uh, not hate me at the end, but you'll hate me less if, after you get to know me. And I think you'll understand me. And that was totally counterintuitive because I used to have this fear that if I didn't think I could convince them, I thought it'd be a bad meeting. I don't want to have bad meetings and I wanted to aver uh, avoid conflict. And so we basically had this view that we're going to meet everyone. And the more you hit us, you know, the more we might be even inclined to talk to you because we think there's misunderstanding and it's not to get you to like us, but so that you will understand us and at least you're, you will be informed. And so we decided to go on a listening tour. At one point in New York City, I am deciding I'll meet everyone that hates me or a lot of them. I ended up meeting like 40 different people tons of horrible meetings, but months later, there was a lot less um, like kind of vitriol against Airbnb. I mean, people suddenly had an understanding. And um, so that really helped a lot. Now we have to meet with like senators, all sorts of politicians. We were on the ballot in San Francisco. How do you uh, fight a ballot initiative? There's like, it's just so crazy because this, because we're a business that's in the real world, the scope of things I've had to learn how to do are astounding. We've had over the summer almost a million people living in a home every night. How do you keep a million people safe every night that are staying in strangers' homes, often from different countries, where sometimes the countries never even live together, like these different cultures? So the bigger lesson is, you know, you had a saying, starting in companies like jumping off a cliff and suddenly an airplane on the way down. And I guess my point is that never stops. That it, it certainly happened for me starting the company, but then it was always the next thing. And now I have new things. And um, so it never stops. And so I think the biggest thing I've had to learn how to do is learn. Yep. And learning means going to the source and I don't know. So last question on the kind of things that surprise you as you, as you, as you grow these globally relevant companies, because you just came back from it. Paris. Yeah, oh God. So. Um, Everyone's obviously quite aware of the horrible things that happened in Paris um, last week. Um, terrorists killed, I think, 129 people um, from ISIS. Um, well, what you may or may not know is that I was in Paris with um, a huge part of the company while the attacks were happening. So 
last week we had our annual convention we have or conference. We have this um, thing called the Airbnb Open, and it's an annual, it's the third year in a row we've done it, and hosts from around the world fly in. Last year was in, here in San, up in San Francisco. This year we had it in Paris. And it's, you know, it's like our version of what Salesforce might call Dreamforce or whatever. And <laughs> hosts come together, and we really kind of update them on the new products, new values, everything. And we had 645 employees fly to Paris to be a part of this, and about 5,000 hosts. And I was there and in Paris with all of them. And my, by the way, my parents were there. My sister, my girlfriend came with me. So like kind of everyone, <laughs> like everyone in my life was there. Um, and I'm in Paris. It's two days into the conference. I finished, I did two keynotes, the first day and second day. So I, I take a deep breath and I'm like, I'm done. Oh, thank God. I'm going to relax. I had this dinner, a celebratory dinner for, we called it the 10th Street Dinner. Basically, we had an office on this 10th Street. And it was basically everyone does the first 40 employees in the company. They're still there. So we called it the, the early employee dinner. And we brought them together to celebrate and recognize them for you know, being at the company for almost five years. And we're having this wonderful dinner. Joe gives a toast. Thank you all. Da, da, da. It's amazing dinner. All of a sudden, our phone starts buzzing. And I see Twitter. I'm like, attack in Paris. And it was at a restaurant. And there was a shooting. We're like, oh, that's really horrible. That's terrible. But not unlike you'd read like something horrible happened in your city. And you're like, OK, that's just really sad. And so then we put our phone away. About 30 minutes later, my phone starts buzzing again. There is a massacre in a theater. 80, 80, 80, 100 people, well, actually, we didn't know it was a massacre at the time. 100 people taken hostage in a theater, another location. Then my phone buzzes again. There's a, uh, a suicide bombing outside of a stadium. Oh my God. Suddenly, my phone buzzes again. At this point, what had happened was we had 645 employees that were going to dinners and events throughout the city of Paris and 5,000 hosts from 110 countries that were throughout the city. And at this moment, there were seven coordinated attacks happening within a one-hour period in random event places all over the city, particularly in the areas that all of our employees were at and all of our hosts were at. And the thing that was so um, scary was the places they picked were gatherings of many people in many countries where all of our, that's who our people were. And they also picked random places to, to create the psychology that these attacks could happen anywhere. So at this point, fear struck over the dinner. We realized we're under attack. There could be another five or 10 attacks, and it could be anywhere. I, got, you know, I started finding out there were employees that were, some, one, one, some of our employees were at a restaurant that were next to the Backland Theater where the massacre was, where 89 people died. And one of, one of my employees, somebody I'm very close to, was sitting in the restaurant looking out the window when they saw all these people running by them for their life. And they're screaming. I mean, the look of when somebody's running for their life and they just witnessed a series of murders, I can only imagine that it feels like. And so people, and then suddenly people were in restaurants. They shut the lights. They closed the metal gates. They're hiding under tables. We had a whole team at the stadium. And the stadium, they had like a stampede. And people were running out of the stamp stadium. So this was not something I've ever had to deal with. So what do you do? So I'm at this party. We have a head of security who's in a different building. He creates a remote command center. I literally create a command center in a walk-in shower because we're in a two-bedroom apartment, 50 people. I had nowhere else to go. I mean, there was this giant shower, and it was actually, frankly, good acoustics because it was just stone. So if you were just sitting there, and I couldn't hear anywhere else, I close the door. We create this command center with our phones, and we pull up our laptops. We still have signal. We were told we might lose internet at any moment. And we're basically go through the first step is account for everybody. So we create a list of all the 645 employees. We start calling and emailing. And we go down the list, and we have this remote command center accounting for everyone. Then we got to figure out what's the next thing we do. We need to work with the local government because some people are going to be sleeping outside, and we can provide housing. So we work with the local city and the federal government of, pa of France and to try to provide housing. And we get our hosts, 300 of them, to open their homes very spontaneously for anyone that needs housing. And then we got to figure out, well, what are we going to do about this conference? And so we had to cancel the next morning and account for people and you know, deal with their families and everyone's reaching out. So it was something that, it was one of those most insane ordeals. We had to fly all the people back, make sure you know, they're, you know, we provide the employee support for them. And I've never had in my life to deal with anything quite like this. We were in the center of this huge crisis. Um, and as remarkable as it was, for that time, 
it's not remarkable in the arc of a startup. In other words, that was very specific, but that physical event is kind of a metaphor of so many things you do, and this was just physical safety. I've never had to deal with something quite life and death like this before, but so much of that remind, I, when, I, when I was going through that last week, I'm like, oh my God, this reminds me of the first four years of Airbnb. And I don't mean, I just mean the, the way my body felt. Mm-hmm. Car, constantly pounding, not knowing how I get through the day, constantly firefighting. I hope I'm selling you on starting a company, by the way. <laughs> um, for the right people, it's a rush, but it is this constant thing. And the other thing that that, the last thing I'll say is, it was at that moment that I reminded me the responsibility I have. Because, you know, I, I'm conscious of the responsibility I have. We have a couple thousand employees. We have tens of millions of community members. But at that moment, you are so much more conscious. Of you, your responsibility is truly real. And people's lives, I mean, in some cases, they maybe do depend on you, or at least their livelihood depends on you. And that was a huge and humbling realization that I had. Yeah, yeah. So uh, can we go a little long? Yeah. Are you good? yeah. Okay, so because I know we're at time, but we're going to go a Sorry, little long. Sure I wanna, no, no, I want to make sure. That was a really important story to get to for all kinds of obvious reasons. But I want to get to a few questions as well. So here. Can you talk more about learning how to learn? Like, was it reading books? Was it self-reflection? Yeah, so. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, talk more about <coughs> learning how to learn. Yeah. I'm certainly not an expert in how to learn. I think people here at Stanford are going to teach you a lot more about how to learn. Um, but I'll give you just one tip. I think there's a lot of tips. I'll give you maybe one. If I told you, I want you to learn about um, a topic and you got a week to do it. So let's say I want you to learn about the basics of UI design and you had a week, what would you do? You would, and I, I want you to really learn it. I want you to learn everything that's important. I want you to become like an expert or at least a temporary expert such that you could know the basics and know the most important things. You would probably read like a ton of books, talk to a ton of people and interview people and go through this fairly exhaustive process to learn about UI design. And so what if I told you, well, in that week, I also actually want you to learn about the basics of front-end development. I want you to learn about the basics of accounting so you can have balanced books. And I want you to also understand how to incorporate a company. Now how do you do that? Because you start adding the hours you don't have hours. So what you learn is you can't learn everything about a topic. So you have to be very good at short-circuiting to learn the, from the definitive source about the topic. And that what be- the skill becomes you hope that you go to the right source. Because if you go to the wrong source, you learn the wrong things. But you also find that if you read the right source, you don't have to read any of their sources. And like, you know, about management, somebody gave me the book, High Output Management. And it turns out I never had to read 10 management books. I just read that one book. That was Keith. It was Keith Rabat, that's right. Yep. And um, it's about Andy Grove, founder of Intel. And like, if you read that book on management, you kind of know about management. <laughs> and, you know, Paul Graham probably was a version of that for Y Combinator. And so... What I've had to learn how to do is seek out the experts, and in like, it, it's kind of the equivalent of like reading in writings of intelligent people. Rather, if you want to learn about the news, read about somebody who's deeply informed than watching like a like a like a political talk show for four hours, because you're going to leave like kind of confused, and if you won't have any deeper context. So I found that going to the source, and Reed was a source for me. Um, I wanted to learn about trust and safety. I went to George Tenet, the director of CIA, and that was fairly oh, like former director, sorry, and that was kind of over the top, but it was helpful. Um, (laughs) And the cool thing is, the more successful you get, the more you have access to them. But even before you get really successful, you can certainly read about the best. And I also learn from biographies. But I think going to the source, there's a lot of other tips, but that's just one tip I would give. And then you gotta be shameless, because I found that, um, you know, most people will help you if you ask a question. And the biggest reason people don't help is because people don't get asked. And you're, you know, we're here to share information and knowledge. So you got to be willing to have the courage to ask people and seek out knowledge. And I was shameless at asking you questions like over and over again to a point where it's probably annoying, but I didn't care. I was so shameless, I didn't care if I annoyed you because I'm like, I need to learn this. Yeah, exactly. Could you talk about the, the prehistory you have with your founders and how you sort of like selected them and knew that they were the right fit for you? Yeah, I, I kind of got really lucky. If I like wrote a book about how to start a company, I think the one part I wouldn't be helpful is how to pick co-founders because I got really lucky. That part kind of fell on my lap. Um, I went to RISD with Joe, and I was friends with him for seven years. It's now 15, but I um, was friends with him for seven years before I started the company with him, and he was kind of like a best friend of mine or one of my best friends. Um, and then my other co-founder, Nate, 
he kind of, I didn't know him. And so that was a little more of like a happenstance. Um, so um, it was kind of luck and I had an intuition he was a great engineer, but it was like, and I could tell by the things he built, he was pretty extraordinary. But there was an element of luck involved with <laughs> Nate. Um, so I'm not the best, I, I, I did not go through the struggle of like having to find co-founders, so I can't tell you a long journey about how you do it. I can say a few things though. Um, the first thing I would say is you should a co found a few things about co-founders. Number one, I think your the mentality should be your co-founder should be better than you. If they're not better than you, they should, you should at least feel like they're equal. And I see a lot of people who find co-founders who they kind of consciously know aren't their equals. And they're not really co-founders. They become proxy early employees that can't scale. And when they can't scale, they get super disenfranchised and they're not useful and they're not able to contribute. And I think sometimes people do it because they're lazy or out of insecurity. They don't want to equal in the company because it may be like a power struggle. I think you should try to find people you admire that are better than you, that challenge you. The mentality is if they're better than you, then you will rise to the occasion and become better because you're around them. And the other thing is you have to have people that you deeply trust and like. You're going to be around these people for 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day. If you're kind of annoyed by them after four hours, you're going to be annoyed by them after month seven, 24-7. You're going to really like not be able to stand them. So you need people that you like, that you trust, and that you admire. And ideally, you have a long history with them. I had a long history with one of the two. But I think Nate, who I didn't have a long history, it proves you don't have to have been friends with them for seven years for it to work. And I generally find complementary skills rather than overlapping skills works. Um, now, Joe and I appear to be the same people on paper, at least our found our origins. But we ended up having, frankly, very different personalities and skills, um, as it turned out. And Nate is totally our opposite in many ways. The woman. Should you repeat the question? Re yeah, yeah. or just summarize it. Okay, so how did I switch from being coming a designer to entrepreneur, and then during tough times, why do I keep going? <laughs> right. oh, so um, switching from designer to entrepreneur, um, it's really like how do you switch from anything to becoming an entrepreneur? Um, I was always kind of, in hindsight, it turns out I always was an entrepreneur. I just never knew it existed. I Meaning I was always like creating things and starting things, although they weren't always businesses. They were usually like, projects or films of my friends or things growing up. I created clubs and so I think the best ex way to become an entrepreneur is just to become an entrepreneur. Like I don't know how else to say it. In other words, just start. And just cr just creating things. Create things of people. The best the best um the best preparation for creating a company is to create a company. If you can't create a company, create a club or create a product or create something. And I found that throughout my history, all the things I created whether it was my club hockey team at college or this thing I designed or a project with my friends for fun. And usually it was outside of school and it was always slightly mischievous, like, you know, like just slightly, like kind of fun or a prank or something. I think that's the best thing. So I, I think that, that other, than, other, other than the fact that it is good to learn in these classes, like the thing that's even more useful than being here right now is to leave this thing and to start something immediately and not learn how to start it, just start it, because you will trust yourself and you'll learn. So uh, that, that was what I did. At RISD, though, I, um, you know, the school f teaches you to start things, because you constantly have, they give you some impossible challenge, like, okay, go, figure it out, go. And I think just having that being almost, it's almost like becoming impulsive. We have to kind of learn to be impulsive in some ways, because just to start and plunge in is kind of an impulsive thing. Um, I think the second question, is why do we keep going during the tough times? Which is another way of saying, why did you have conviction and resilience, right? Because you need to have resilience and conviction to keep going. Um, the thing about startups, of course I keep quoting things that Steve Jobs said because he's one of the people I've learned a lot from, from afar, of course. Um, so, yep, so there's a lesson, study people you admire. But he, he said you have to be passionate about things you do because there are going to be days where it's so hard, it's easy to stop believing in it. So if you don't have this reservoir of deep passion for what you're doing, you'll like kind of lose faith and stop believing in it when it gets really hard. And I had this deep conviction it would work. And many people say, well, why'd you have this conviction? Why'd you believe Arab Breakfast would work? 
And it was that very first weekend, we hosted three people, and I saw how my life changed, and I saw how other people's lives changed. They literally changed. People, one person moved. The other person decided to go on a different path because of the designers he met. And I thought, with Joe, if people could experience what I'd experienced that first weekend, this would be an idea that spread around the world. And I really believed that. Now, I couldn't get people to actually give it a shot, but I believed that was a marketing challenge and that we would get them to try it because we discovered something. And one of the things Paul Graham says is, what insight do you have that no one else has? In other words, what is it something that you've discovered? Often, a discovery doesn't happen in a laboratory. A discovery is something that you hacked to solve a problem for yourself, and you accidentally discovered it's really cool, and if only other people knew about it. And my unique insight discovery was staying with other people in their homes was deeply rewarding and save money. It would be awesome, and other people want to do it. And, and it was clearly non-intuitive, non-obvious, which is a good thing, because when you tell people like that will never work. So that means people won't copy you for a couple years. Uh, here. How do you, uh, uh, you said that you were distracted by the roommate thing you were working on <coughs> after you started. So how did you go get back to the area? Really good question. Really good question. So. And repeat the question. Oh, sorry. So you say conviction is important, but you started Airbnb and Breakfast, then you did a roommate thing, and then you went back. How, what was that journey like? Um, you know, it's kind of funny. I think conviction happens over time, and it happens through like, repetition of talking about it and thinking about it and working it out with people. So kind of here's how it happened. We started this website and I had some conviction that this would work. The weekend we started, I had conviction it would work around the country, air beds for conferences. I was always like a generation ahead. I was never three generations ahead. I didn't think like years out, but I always thought like the next year out. And I could always see the next step. I couldn't see three steps forward. And so I believed in the next step. So that first weekend, I believed this would work around the country. But I, Joe and I convinced ourselves out of the idea because we were so enamored by the story of Facebook and all these other companies. We thought, they're huge. I can see the next step, but I can't see people all over the world doing this. I can't see becoming a co like a company where millions of people would use. And I want to have a company millions of people use. And millions of people need roommates, but millions of people when they travel don't stay in homes. And so that was kind of where I went to. So it wasn't as much I lost conviction as much as I had the wrong mental model to decide what to pursue. But I deeply believed in this idea. We did the roommate site, and I was like, okay, someone's done it, and I don't know if I'm passionate about it. And I went home for Christmas, and I found myself talking about it. And the funny thing is, the more I talked about it, the more excited I got. And the more I talked about it, I'm, I'm a fairly extroverted person, so extroverted people, like, they kind of figure things out by talking it out. And I talk about it, and I, as I talk the idea out, I keep adding things, even though I hadn't built it yet. I was like, <laughs> yeah, like as if I had. Like, and then we could do this and that, and you'd brainstorm. And the conviction happens through repetition and, like, investigating and going deeper and exploring and thinking about it. And, and it just kind of built from there. And then it came through more and more physical experiences of doing it, staying, and the more you have real experiences, the more you build that reservoir of conviction. And the one thing people want to talk about leadership is leaders are people other people follow. They're not necessarily people they're bosses. A leader is somebody other people follow. And a key core uh, reason why somebody follows you is conviction. In other words, a leader has to have conviction. And if, you, I don't, if I'm like, I think the way you get home is that way, like, like uh, maybe. If I say the way you get home is that way, I know it's that way. People will probably go that way because you are so certain. Now, you can't, you got to try not to be wrong, but conviction is incredibly important for leadership. And for me, building the reservoir of conviction was through real life experiences and talking it through and getting to know the problem. The, the other nuance, by the way, on a lot of these companies is they make markets. So it wasn't like, oh, how many people were staying in homes before? Far fewer. How many people were taking black car services before? Far fewer. How many people, like just other things, and part of that making of markets is part of what you have to have the conviction for. <laughs> yeah, just one nuance of that, which is that was what happened. We fell into the venture capital trap or the like so called like trap of, well, That's is the it. The dumb venture capitalist. The dumb seminary, sorry. <laughs> He's a venture capitalist. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the dumb VC trap. Yes. The, they, they call it the idiot VC, which is there's no market for this. And you're right, like, as Reed says, almost all great companies created the market. And so a lot of people say like they invest in markets. 
and I think you should invest first and foremost in product and founders. You can invest in markets in the, if you think our, as long as our markets travel or accommodations, but our market was not. In fact, Sequoia, who's notorious for invest or not notorious, but famous for investing in markets, they really struggled sizing our market, but they actually, to their credit, discovered this was a big market. And as long as they looked at the right things, and they thought, well, there's half a trillion dollars a year spent on accommodations every year, short term, two trillion dollars a year spent on travel, and 40 billion spent on vacation rentals. So we do think, based on we like these founders and we like the product, we think there will be a market. And so you have to be able to foreshadow emerging markets rather than existing markets. Last question in the back. Oh, What's difficult for you Jesus right now? Christ. The problem is that's a very long answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> answering that question, that would be the... Answer. Yeah, yeah, answering that question is extremely difficult right now. Um, you may have stumped me in the last question. Um, let's see. Okay, I'll tell you one thing. Um, so this is, I think this is like in your book, you talk about it as like transitioning from like um, city to nation or village mm -hmm. to city, yep. which is... One of the things you have to do, so I've gone through all different phases. We're at the phase now where the company is working, the core business is working well. The, the product we had, the idea we had, is now scaling. It's working well. We've hired an executive team. I have a full executive team. They're managing it. I could presumably go away for a month or two months, and the company would basically run fine, basically, right? I mean, there's things that would start to degrade, but the core product will be fine. Um, the company, more so than the product, needs day-to-day -day management, but the company, the product's fine. So there's a couple things. The first, probably the two biggest things I'm focused on, the first one is scaling the culture for the new size. A lot of the cultural norms and, and kind of things we institutionalized was for a company that was like 500 people. We're now over 2,000 people. And I want to make sure that this still feels like a fast-growing startup. It's still product-oriented. It's still everyone's mission-driven. So that means a lot of the methods and behaviors in like the day-to-day -day has to change. Um, the other thing, though, probably even bigger, is you know most companies that are really really big have more than one product. Um, Apple, you know, has the Mac, but they have the iPhone, the iPod, the iPad, um, the watch, and the very few companies have a single product. I mean, you guys have multiple sources of revenue, right? Yeah. You don't have one source of revenue. Almost. No company in the world has a single product. I mean, Google is maybe a notable exception as having many products, but kind of one product that generates <laughs> most of the revenue. And so that's the challenge for me now is the core products can continue to grow, um, but there's opportunities to start other products. And part of me is like, well, I know how to start a product. I started one, but how do you start a product or a new business inside of an existing business that's successful? It's, I thought it was just like the first time. It turns out, starting a new business inside of an ex existing successful business is so different than starting a business because you have all these things that are helpful, like you can pull people internally, you have unlimited funding, but you have all these things that you never thought. Like sometimes people inside the company inadvertently don't try to stop it. And they don't do it on purpose, but like you try to pull the best people on the team, like, no, we can't have it. Or why are we focusing here? We need to fix this. So that's a huge thing that I'm focusing on right now is trying to create a new business inside of the company. And you basically, you're shifting from a single product company to a dual product company. That's a pretty big shift. And so that's something that I'm thinking a lot about now. And I think all enduring companies have to do that because if you're a technology company, you can't presume your original invention, your original product is the thing that you're selling many, many years from now. So let's thank Brian for joining us. Thank you guys.